Hi, I'm Damien, hardware engineer of Facebook. I will be joined by Chris and Yin to present Facebook Next Generation 2 Socket Server Architecture. I will give an overview, system architecture, design flexibility considerations, and hardware security. Chris will cover mechanical and Yin will cover the thermals. So our path is a project name of our next generation two socket server based on Kubernetes CPU. It utilizes three OCP accepted solutions, namely ORV2 in a one OU, full width, full length, two OCP NIC 3.0, more home factor slots, one OCP USB debug port, the design support up to two PCI full height half length cap. It has one reserved data hard disk slot, two USB 2.0 ports, flexibility of inserting up to eight fans, and expansion bay supporting four E1.S 25 millimeter in the flexible side channel, which I'm gonna talk more in the later slides. Last but not least, we support hardware platform firmware resiliency. First of all, we look at the CPU system architecture. It is using Intel Copilot in a two socket form factor. The DDR channel count and PCI link count are non public information according to Intel at this time. Hence, we are never disclosed at this stage, but it does look pretty standard. I will highlight three things here in the PCH and BMC system architecture. This generation, we support two USB 3.0. The bottom USB port also serves as a debug card. So it has a dual use there. We implemented hardware PFR to protect against BIOS and BMC flash intrusion. There will be more details about this in the later slides. When we have two OCP NIC 3.0, each of them have a dedicated NCSI channel to BMC in the SAR topology. We continue to build our server to be flexible. While Sonar Path is designed for ORV to rack with travel input, we also design an add-on converter, which for convert 48 to 12 volts up front. So it also can be used in the ORV3 rack with minor modification. Our side channel is flexible. We design it for E1.S 25 millimeters as our initial solution but it also can be modified to suit your own needs, such as the cable out, E1.L, a different form factor of E1.S, or even the blank. We have seen a third party creating custom solution in terms of a custom cubby to use our TioCopath two socket server in a 19 inch rack. Hence, our current design of Sonora Pass also allow the aftermarket modification to fit our motherboard into a 90-inch chassis. But of course, we will don't get all the bells and whistle for the side channel flexibility. This generation, we also beef up security aspect by implementing hardware platform firmware resiliency solution. It has three main functions. First, it able to detect intrusion detection because it authenticates the firmware before the boot. After the boot, it keeps sniffing the bus and able to stop the attack when it detects it and by overriding the bus ownership. Any time that it failed authentication, it will perform auto recovery, such as refreshing with non-good firmware. 
let's quickly step through its boot flow in the timing diagram. We added a pre-boot stage to authenticate the BMC firmware. If it passed, it will continue to authenticate the BIOS firmware. During this time, the server appears non-functional. And we added a PFR LED that will be blinking yellow and blue when it's doing the authentication or the recovery process. So we know some activity is happening. If you want to know more what's happening, you can plug in, in the debug card into the source so you can see the status message of what's happening in the background. If the BIOS firmware authentication pass, we go into the boot stage and now we go through the regular flow of power on the BMC and PCH. Due to limited time, the recovery process is not covered. Now I'll pass it to Chris to talk about our mechanical innovations. Thank you, Damien. Uh, as Damien mentioned, my name is Chris Chamberlain. I'm a mechanical engineer based out of the, for Facebook, based out of the Austin, Texas office. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes just to go over some of the mechanical features in this Sonora Pass server. Um, so we'll, we'll start with the front panel and, and look at the different modules in the front panel. So moving from left to right, as Damien mentioned, we have some E1.S modules on the, uh, on the left side of the chassis as you're looking at it. Now the, these modules, you can choose to populate them or not, and so there's a, there are the modules, or you can just put in a blanking plate. Uh, moving just to the right of that, we have the an asset pull tag, which is a little plastic tag where you can uh, put a label for the serial number or, or whatever you want on that chassis to help identify it. Uh, moving further to the right, uh, we have uh, a slot for the NIC 3.0, which you can populate the NIC 3.0, or you can insert a blanking, uh, blanking module, blanking plate. Um, and right above that is a PCIe card, PCIe card, which again you could put in the card or a blank if, if you don't have something populated. Then more towards the middle of the chassis, we have a three and a half inch hard drive. And uh, if you don't want to use the hard drive and, and you want to go with an SSD configuration, we also have a blank for that. Uh, and then moving on to the right, we have another uh, group of a NIC 3.0 and PCIe card, which again, you can populate or, or use blanks. Now, if we flip this chassis around to the rear panel, you'll see that we have four dual rotor fans uh, that's around the middle. Now, there are also two riveted fan blanks on the outsides of this chassis. So um, if you needed to, if you wanted to, you could expand this to, to house eight dual rotor fans. Now if we open the hood of the server and look at some of the modules inside the chassis, um, you'll see again the four E1.S modules that I that we had mentioned over there on the, the left side of the chassis. You can see the hard disk drive um, it comes with a cage and you slide the hard disk drive in from the front. Uh, here you also get a look at the PCIe riser assemblies and, and there are a few variants of this that you can choose to whatever suits your needs. Uh, then moving back, we have, you see the green air baffle. Uh, this air baffle is removable, and when you open it, it gives you access to the CPU, the heat sinks, and the, uh, the dim sockets. Now if we move back to the back half of the chassis, you can see two fan, fan controller boards, and these boards, uh, you can see the, the four fans that, that plug into them, so these, these control the fans. And then if you look right in the middle, um, you see a little heat sink. Uh, that is the 48 volt converter board that Damien had mentioned um, in case we want to use this uh, in an ORV3 rack. It's, it's configurable and you have the module. In, in most cases on the ORV2 configuration this will not be populated. Finally I'd like to point out some some mechanical design highlights that we have and these are kind of centered around uh, serviceability and, and Ease of, ease of repair for these things. Uh, given that this is a 1U, 1OU chassis, it's a little bit awkward and, and heavy 
to manipulate. So we wanted to make sure that you could access most of the frues that are in the front half of, of the device without having to re completely remove the, de the device from the rack. So what we've done is we made a split cover design where there's a, a rear cover that can stay in place and the front half of the top cover, the front cover as we're calling it, which will release. So the idea here is the uh, technician, data center technician can come in and remove this, partially remove this chassis and it'll slide out um, about three quarters of the way and then there's a, it'll, there's a safety catch which will latch onto the, the rack shelf uh, and prevent it from coming out all the way. Now if you want to pull it out all the way you can just hit that rack release button there and, and pull it out all the way. But the idea is you pull it out halfway and it cantilevers out of the, it cantilevers out of the rack and then you can remove the front cover and access uh, most of the frues which are in the front of the board. Uh, now if you need to get any of the frues in, in the back side of the, in the back half of the chassis, you will have to remove it all the way, but again, you can just remove the, the, the back cover, the rear cover. Uh, the split chassis allows us to do this. Uh, then the other design uh, that was put in there to address serviceability is some hot, hot swappable fan modules. So you can see in the picture on the right that we have the four fan modules and they, they come as they're dual rotor fans and they're just little modules that, that have a really easy handle and, and thumb latch that you squeeze in and pull it straight out. These are hot swappable from the hot aisle so uh, the technician can go in there and just, just pull out a fan and, and swap a new one in. Uh, and with that I can pass this over to Yin to talk about the thermal aspects of this design. Thanks. Hello everyone, this is Yin. I'm a thermal engineer at Facebook side. Uh, thanks for attending our presentation. Uh, for the next session, also the last session, I will talk about the thermal design. Uh, so uh, first of all, I would like to talk about the CPU heatsink data. At the CPU heatsink data, I would like to cover two portions. First is the efforts we made to uh, enhance the heatsink structure and also the efforts we made uh, to improve the thermal performance. On the enhancement of the heatsink uh, heat structure, uh, we included the two ribs on the base and the integrated fins on the side. And we also reduced the two layers of the heat pipe to be one layer. Uh, with all these changes, we are trying to uh, increase the heatsink base stiffness. And also uh, by using these changes, we are able to pass the 500 hour 160 degree C high temperature reliability test. And we did not see the fin delamination issue happen again, uh, which was uh, found in our original data. And on the improvement of the uh, thermal performance side, uh, we selected the two six millimeter uh, and the two eight millimeter heat pipes. And we also included the remote fin data into the heatsink. Uh, both of the fin pitches on the remote fin, remote heatsink and the main heatsink are optimized. Uh, and also uh, we cut out the center portion of the remote fin uh, and lower the heat pipe uh, height to allow more fresh air and uh, fresh air going through the uh, remote fin and directly to the main heatsink. Uh, by applying all these changes, uh, comp comparing to the comparing to the baseline data, we are able to improve the thermal performance by about 14%. And for the next portion, I would also talk about some vintage data modifications we made in this platform. So. Uh, at the original design, the fan cage design, we do see the fan cage has a significant impact on the total airflow rate. So we're trying to uh, mitigate this uh, impact to the whole, whole system. So we made some modifications on the fan cage. Uh, first of all, we used an embossed fan guard design to increase the opening ratio. And we also include a tunnel design at the outlet of the fan to improve the air organization. And finally, we used a curved fan connector design to reduce the back pressure. 
by combining, combining all these improvements, uh, we are able to reduce the fan cage impact on the total air flow rate from 18% to 5%. So uh, for the whole platform, we also include some air buffers. So uh, different air buffers has been used in the system, which can be used, uh, which can help uh, to optimize the thermal performance and uh, minimize the air bypass. So some types of the air buffer are shown here. So uh, for example, like the main air buffer to uh, optimize, optimize the airflow going through the CPU and the gym arrays, and then the NIC air buffer um, to allow more air directly going through the NIC. And also the dummy dims uh, when the dim is not populated, uh, and also the NIC air blocker when NIC is not installed. So thanks for attending our presentation, and uh, uh, please join the rest of the presentations in the server book. Thanks, everyone.